The Head Man by Robert Bloch. His name was Otto Krantz, and he was the greatest actor in Berlin. And was not Berlin the capital of the entire reasonable world? He appeared before the public every day in the same drama, in the same role. Now, in 1937, it appeared as though the show might run forever. But no one seemed bored by his performance, and Otto Krantz did his best to keep it this way. He was never satisfied, but continued to rehearse and seek improvements in his part. Take the matter of costume, for example. Krantz always appeared in evening clothes, but of a very simple cut. This sober garb was a surprising contrast, for many of the minor players wore gaudy uniforms or sought attention by wearing outlandish rags. But Krantz, after much study, realized his modest attire brought him more popular approval than the extravagant outfits of the others. Again, the other actors were given to impassioned gestures as gaudy as their clothing. They shouted at the audience, they ranted, raved, wept, scowled, and went into hysterics. The spectators were never impressed. They much preferred the business-like approach of Otto Krantz, who said little but acted with the finesse of a master. He never played to the gallery. While on stage, he went through the business as if the audience didn't exist. For this reason, Krantz remained the most popular actor in Berlin, playing over and over again the self-same role in the self-same comedy. The comedy was entitled The Third Reich. The stage was the platform of the public executioner. Otto Krantz filled the role of official headsman. Each performance boasted a new supporting cast and a growing audience to cheer the comedy on. It was always the same. Every morning Krantz made his grand entrance in the bleak courtyard, instructed the new players in a stage whisper, and graciously conducted them to the center of the platform. With becoming modesty, the great actor allowed each a moment alone in the spotlight in which to receive the tribute of the spectators. After this, the show proceeded swiftly. Capable assistants did the placing and the binding, but it was Otto Krantz who tested the straps, bowed politely to the military escort, and then raised the bright shining blade of the headsman's axe from its place in a block of ice. Then came the glorious moment of climax, the moment that never failed to move both the minor players and the crowd. And when it was over, Otto Krantz lifted the head from the basket and held it up to his applauding audience with an honest smile of workmanlike pride. This happened not once, but as often as ten or a dozen times in a single morning. Yet Krantz never faltered, never grew tired, never missed a line or a cue. A sneering Prussian of the old school, the sniveling young son of a lower class family, a withered Hausfrau, or a rosy cheeked beauty, all received the same efficient courtesy at the hands of the executioner, hands that grew stained and red with the drops that fell as each head was lifted from the basket. At the end of the performance, Otto Krantz bowed retired, and washed his hands like a common laborer. Democratic was the official headsman. Outside of his public appearances, Krantz led a quiet life, a glass of schnapps when work was through, perhaps a little beer at a wash-down dinner at some humble beer stube, a stroll through the street to hear the news and then home to the big upstairs room near SS District Headquarters. In the evening there might be a party meeting to attend, 
or a summons notifying him of tomorrow's labors. It was a simple existence, for Otto Krantz did not share the hysteria of the times. He served the Reich with no thought of personal pleasure or profit. Let others raise the rabble and bluster in public meetings. In this time, Krantz had cut short a good many of these speakers, cut them short by a neck. These days might bring honors to a wiser head, but many wiser heads fell into his basket. Krantz was content. A year ago he had been a humble butcher. Since leaving the slaughterhouse for a public post, he had seen enough of the world and its ways, and had met many people. Officially, in the past year, he had met several thousand. Each acquaintance was of painfully short duration, but it was enough. He had gazed into the faces of the best families of Germany. He had held those faces in his hands, those proud, proud faces that would never smile again. And he knew that the blue blood stained his axe with gore as red as that of the lowest thief. So Krantz was content, until gradually the faces came too fast. It was impossible to ignore them any longer. He felt himself becoming interested in them because they passed in such an endless variety before his eyes. For each face masked a secret, each skull held a story. Young, old, pure, debauched, innocent, guilty, foolish, wise, shamed, defiant, cringing, bold. Ten a day, twenty a day. They mounted the platform and bent their necks to the yoke of death. Who were these people he conducted into eternity? He, a simple butcher, was shaping the destiny of Germany, shaping it with the axe. What was the nature of that destiny? These faces knew. Krantz tried to find out. He began to peer more closely at each prisoner in turn. Without realizing it, he gazed deeper into dead eyes, felt the shapes of skulls, traced the texture of hair and skin. One day after work, he entered a bookstall and brought texts on phrenology and physiography. That had been two months ago, and now he had gone farther in his speculations. Now, when work was through, he went home quickly and threw himself down on the bed. With eyes closed, he waited for the faces of the day to pass in review. They came, pallid, noble faces molded in sadness or rage, three thousand death masks, and the end did not yet. And with them came a message. You, Otto Krantz, are our master. You are the most powerful man in the Reich. Not Hitler, not Goebbels, not Himmler or the others. You, Otto Krantz, hold the real power of life and death. At first, Krantz was afraid of such thoughts, but every day came a dozen new reminders, a dozen new faces to review in darkness. To remember, to relish. To relish? But of course, it was a pleasure now. To be quiet. To dress in black. To wear a mask. To hide the secret thoughts. And then come home to revel alone with three thousand memories. For weeks now, his memories had seemed to center around one particular moment. The moment when he held up the head and gazed into the face. Lately, he had been forced to hold himself sternly in check as he did so, lest he betray his excitement. This was the supreme thrill to hold the heads. 
If there was only some way to recapture that thrill, that sensation of power at will, if only he could steal the heads. That was madness. If he were discovered, he would die. And for what? The foolish face of a gaping old wastrel? Not that. Not a grey old head with a cruel, stupid face. It was not worth the risk. But there were other heads. Strange heads of debauchees. Golden heads of beautiful ladies that hung before him in dreams. These were worth possessing. Worth the risk. To sit in his room and behold forever such symbols of his secret glory. There was a dream. He must find a way, Krantz decided. It would be necessary to visit the condemned cells nightly when the lists of execution were given out. Then he could inspect the crop and make his choices. He might make an arrangement with old Fritz, the scavenger who did the burials of all the unclaimed bodies. For a few marks, Fritz would do anything. Then Otto Kranz could go home with a burlap bag slung over his shoulder. Nobody would be the wiser. Kranz thought it all out carefully. He had to be careful, make sure no one suspected, for if they knew, they would not understand. They might think he was crazy and shut him away. Then he wouldn't have his axe anymore. He wouldn't be able to polish the heavy, gleaming blade every morning before work started. And he couldn't see the heads every day. That must not be permitted to happen. So he was very careful the next few times he went to work. Nobody who noticed the tall, broad-shouldered man with the close-cropped mustache and bald head would suspect that behind that stern, impassive countenance there lurked a dream. Even his victims didn't realize it when he stared at their faces each morning. Perhaps the black mask he wore helped to disguise the hideous intensity of his searching stare. It also concealed his disappointment, for none of these traitors had the face that would satisfy him. None seemed to hold the symbol of power he desired. There was nothing but a succession of commonplace countenances. Kranz was disappointed, but he didn't give up. He went to Gestapo headquarters one evening late in the week. He passed up the broad stairs and received the salute of the sentinel troopers with the dignity befitting an official of the Reich. He had no trouble in the outer offices. The man at the desk chuckled when he heard Krantz make his request. You want to see the list for tomorrow? Here. It's ready. Only seven of the swine. For high treason. You can probably do the job with one hand. Otto Kranz didn't laugh. He spoke again, smoothly. If you please, I should like to see the prisoners. See them? Yes. The man at the desk shrugged. Uh, that is very irregular. I'm afraid you'd have to ask Inspector Grunert for permission. But can't you? One must obey orders, you know. Let me announce you. The desk official buzzed the intercom, spoke briefly, and then raised his head. You may go right in, he said, nodding towards the door behind him. Krantz forced a rigid smile. He had to go through with this, carry it off. If only he could get permission, it would be easy to make further plans. As he entered Inspector Grunert's office, the rigid smile became suffused with incredulous delight. For there, sitting on the bench before the inspector's desk, were the two prisoners he wanted, the answers to his prayers, his dreams. Otto Kranz stared at them closely, 
noting with growing pleasure each detail of their faces. The man was old, for only the old have long white hair. The man was young, for only the young have smooth, delicately pointed features unwrinkled by the years. Then the man was ageless, for only the ageless have great green glowing eyes that burn upwards from unthinkable recesses of the brain behind. Then he looked at the other prisoner, the woman. The woman was a wanton, for only wantons have wildly burnished locks that flow like flame above their brows. The woman was a saint, for only a saint has the white ecstatic purity of a face transfigured by suffering. The woman was a child, for only a child has eyes that beam in beauty. She is the woman I want, droned the voice within Otto Krantz. He couldn't tear his eyes from them. The long white hair, the long red hair the slim necks, the greenish glow of their eyes. Father and daughter, father and daughter of mystery, creatures of another world, a world of dreams. And tomorrow they would become his dreams, his to possess, symbols of his power, the power of the headman's axe. These were the two he wanted. Ah, Krantz, there, here you are. Smiling, Grunert rose and extended a fleshy palm. Just in time to meet two future clients, the fat inspector bowed sardonically in the direction of the prisoners. Allow me to present Joachim Fulger and his daughter, Eva. They did not stir. Neither man nor girl looked at Otto Krantz. Their eyes rejected the presence of the headsman, the inspector, and the room itself. Gruner chuckled. Cool heads, eh? Wonderful heads, purred the voice inside Otto Krantz, but his lips remained closed. Yes, continued the inspector. One runs across all types in line of duty. Queer fish. Take these two specimens, for example. I'm going to, whispered the inner voice. Grunard could not hear it as he went on. What do you suppose these two have been doing? He inquired. You'll never guess, so I'll tell you. They just signed the confession, in case you don't believe me. What? Asked Otto Krantz, knowing it was expected of him. Practicing sorcery against the Reich. Can you imagine such a thing in this day and age? Sticking pins in the image of our Fuhrer? Grunart scowled reflectively. Their block leader got wind of it last month. Sounded fantastic. But he checked them just as a matter of routine. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed to know that they were queer ones. Selling love potions, telling fortunes, and all that. But when the block leader dropped in to pay them a visit, all very pleasant, not in an official capacity or anything, this swine of a magician and his unnatural offspring put an ice pick into his throat. The two prisoners did not stir. Inspector Grunert nodded at Krantz and tapped his head significantly. You see how it is, he shrugged. They could get the camp or a firing squad, but I decided the sorcery charge was the one to press. Make it high treason, I said. Her Guebels is always looking for a story. And here's a good example to set before those who work secretly against the Fuhrer. He rose and confronted the silent, unblinking pair. Cool as cucumbers, aren't they? But they cursed enough when we had brought them in, I can tell you that. A few days here and they signed the confessions without a murmur. Crazy fanatics, trying to kill men by sticking pins in photographs and dolls. 
why it's barbaric. A laugh crawled out of Joachim Filger's white throat. The voice that followed it was curiously disturbing. Do you hear, Ava, my child? We are barbaric, says this barbarian in his murderer's uniform. He sits here in his torture chamber and explains our barbarism to the brutal savage whose axe will shear our heads from our necks tomorrow morning. Again, the laughter. Otto Krantz watched it well out of the white throat. The axe would bite there, so... The girl's voice came now. We are sorcerers too by his standards. But our magic is cleaner than the spells of these madmen, with their chanting slogans, their howling worship of ancient gods. Our crime is that we have fought evil with evil, and apparently we have lost. But the day will come, those who take the sword must perish by the sword. Those that take whips shall die beneath them and those who wield the axe will lie beneath it. The words moved Krantz until he remembered that she was possessed. A witch, a lunatic, but she was beautiful. That long white throat, he'd strike it there. Let them rave, Brunner chuckled. But you wanted to see me about something, Krantz? It does not matter, some other time muttered the headsman. Very well, Grunert faced the prisoners. You will meet Krantz again tomorrow morning. Perhaps then he can match your sharp tongues with something sharper. Eh, hey, Otto? Yes, Krantz whispered. He couldn't tear his eyes from them. The long white hair, the long red hair, the slim necks. The greenish glow of their eyes. Creatures from another world. A world of dreams. And tomorrow they would become his dreams. His to possess. Symbols of the power of the axe. These were the heads he wanted. Abruptly, Otto Krantz turned and stumbled out of the room. He had remembered a duty to perform. A most important duty. He had to get back to his room and begin. It wasn't until he busied himself at the vital task that Krantz permitted himself to feel the thrill of anticipation again. But then it could no longer be held back, and Otto Krantz grinned in glee as he sat in the darkness of his room and delicately sharpened the headsman's axe. You want I should let you have the heads from those two bodies and bury the corpses secretly? Nine. Fritz the scavenger shook his head in bewildered but emphatic denial. But nobody has registered to claim the bodies. No one will know if you quicklime them with the heads or not, Krantz wheedled. I cannot do this thing, Fritz grumbled. Otto Krantz smiled. Fifty marks in it for you, he whispered. Fritz blinked, but still he shook his head. I can get you extra butter rations, Krantz murmured. I will talk to the district leader tomorrow. Fritz sighed. I would do it for you without pay, he said, but I cannot. You see, the Fulgers are not going to be beheaded after all. What? What? Krantz reacted with a shocked grimace. But the inspector himself told me. Fritz shrugged. I have just come from headquarters. It was decided to drop the sorcery charge as foolish. The murder charge was upheld. They will die early in the morning before a firing squad. Shot, not beheaded. Then, and only then, did Otto Krantz realize how much the possession of those two heads meant to him. He had come away from his room in the middle of the night, carrying his axe in its velvet case. He had scurried through the streets, his official evening dress 
gaining him free passage from any SS troopers encountered on the way. He had hurried here to the little room where Fritz the Scavenger dwelt, and all the while he had been hugging the thought of what was to come, gloating over the attainment of his goal. And now the opportunity had slipped away. With it, something slipped in Otto Kranz's brain. He could feel it. The usurpation of his consciousness by that single pulsing urge. He couldn't define the sensation. He knew only one thing. He must get those heads. He must get those heads. They hung before him in midair, those mocking twin faces, one with long white curls, one with red. They were laughing at his confusion, his dismay, his defeat. His defeat? Never. Never. Is it still true that no one has claimed the bodies? Yes, that is so. Then after the Fulgers are shot, you will still take them to the lime vats. I suppose? Who has signed the papers for execution? No one, of course, you remember. Inspector Grunert always does that when he arrives first thing in the morning. Krantz rubbed his hands. So no orders have been actually issued yet. No firing squad is appointed. No time has been set. That is true. Very well then. Fritz, I offer a hundred marks to you for the heads. Uh, but there will be no heads, I tell you. They'll be shot. Krantz smiled. No, they won't. I'm taking the Fuggers out to the yard right now. I'll get the job over with before the official ceremony begins at dawn. But the orders- Who will know? I'll tell Grunert I picked up the order along with the rest at his office and took the liberty of assigning a squad to do the job, just to save him the trouble. He'll sign the order afterwards and forget about it. He'll never bother to ask who did the shooting, and since the bodies are unclaimed, you can cart them away. The risk. They'll see you do it. No one will see. I shall bring them here myself. Here? To my room? I'll tidy it up again for you, my fastidious friend. No, I won't permit it. We'll be caught. Fritz. Francis's voice was very soft when he uttered the name, but his face was hard. His hands, his butcher's hands, were harder as they closed about the throat of the old scavenger. Fritz fell back, choking. Yes, yes, but hurry. It's nearly dawn now. Krantz hurried. He picked up the necessary papers in the inspector's office. He raced down the silent, night-lined halls to the cell blocks, located a blinking guard, and bawled orders to the surprised fellow in convincing tones. Where's the escort? The guard protested. Upstairs, waiting, snapped Krantz. You're gonna take them up alone? You saw the orders. Get the Fulgers for me. At once. Befuddled, the guard led him to the cell. The Fulgers were waiting. Yes, they were waiting, and their green eyes gleamed in the murky dawn. There was no trouble. They preceded Krantz up the stairs without a word. The headsman followed slamming the outer door in the guard's face. This way, said Otto Krantz. He indicated a door. Fulger and his daughter obeyed. The outer halls were deserted, and Krantz, with a pounding heart, knew they would reach Fritz's quarters without being seen. They did. Fritz had everything in readiness. 
He had hauled out an extra block of ice, and the axe was embedded deeply therein to keep the edge sharp. He had set up the official block as well. The basket and sawdust were waiting. It was all done in the proper regulation manner, just as it would be outside. He handed Otto Krantz the headsman's mask. Krantz donned it. Joachim and Eva Fugger stood against the wall of the little room under the cell blocks and stared. The old man turned to Krantz. But the court decreed that we'd be shot, he murmured. Why the axe? And why here inside? Where are the guards? Where are the officials? The bony fingers of Otto Krantz raked across his mouth. Silence! Ava's expression did not change. She merely opened her mouth a trifle and screamed. Krantz stopped that. Her curls helped. Twisted expertly about her throat, they muffled further outcry. Fritz had the old man kneeling now. He kicked the block into place. Krantz drew the axe from the ice. There was a deathly silence in the little room. A deathly silence. I warn you, murmured Joachim Fulger. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Krantz had a sharp retort for that. The axe. The nightmare was over. Cleaning the room, hiding the bodies until they were ready for the lime, getting the burlap sack. Fritz tended to all that. Otto Krantz appeared in the courtyard promptly at dawn, ready for his official duties. Grunert was there, and some others. The seven victims were let out. Krantz labored. It was all a red blur. He plodded through his task mechanically now, as he had in the slaughterhouse long ago. The significance was gone from the moment. Sheep bleated. Sheep died. He could hardly wait to get home. Grunert casually inquired about the Fulgers after the executions were over. Trance mentioned taking the liberty of arranging for the firing squad on his own authority then quite indifferently presented the order for signing. Gruner shrugged, signed without reading, and sent it along with the rest for the official files. It was over then. Fritz had his hundred marks in a wallet, and Otto Krantz? He had his sack. He hugged it to his breast as he sped through the streets toward home. No need to stop for food or drink today. There was a substitute for food and drink in the sack. For here were dreams come true. Krantz ran the last few blocks, his feet moving in rhythm with his pulsing heart. When he locked himself in the room, he was almost afraid to look for a moment. Suppose they had changed. But they had not changed. White-haired Joachim and auburn-tressed Eva stared up at him with glowing green eyes. Their faces were set in grimaces of undying hate, and Krantz stared stared as Perseus stared into the countenance of Medusa. He gazed at their gorgonic grinning and laughed aloud. Someone seeing him right now might think him mad, he reflected. But he was not mad. Not he, Otto Kranz, official headsman of the Third Reich. 
no madman could have been as clever, as cunning, as crafty as he. These two had been mad. Mad with their babbling of sorcery and witchcraft. They had not even had the sense to be afraid of death. They had mocked him, ridiculed him, called him a crude barbarian. Well, perhaps he was a barbarian. A headhunter, maybe. Like those Indians in South America. Givaros, weren't they? That's what he was. A headhunter. Kranz laughed. They had mocked him, so now he mocked them. He talked to the heads for a long time. He flung their words in their teeth. Those that live by the axe shall perish beneath it, they had said. And as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Kranz told them what he thought of that. He told them a great deal. After a while, he no longer realized that he was talking to the dead. The heads seemed to nod and shake in answer to his words. The grins expanded sardonically. They were laughing at him again. Krantz grew angry. He shouted at the heads. He shouted so loudly that at first he didn't hear the knocking on his door. Then, when it rose to a thunderous crescendo, he turned. With a start, he realized that it was already dusk. Where had the day gone to? The knocking persisted. Krantz got out the burlap bag, filled it and shoved it under his bed. Then he answered the door, straightening his collar and striving to control the tremble of his lips. Let me in. It was Fritz, the scavenger. He stood quivering in the doorway until Otto Kranz dragged him across the threshold by the scruff of the neck. What is it? The Fulkers. Their bodies have been claimed by a relative. A cousin, I think. He comes tonight to take them for burial. No, he can't do that. But he is. He has received permission. And we shall be found out. And it will mean the axe for us. Krantz managed to control his voice. He thought fast, frantically. Desperation blossomed into inspiration. Where are the bodies now? He whispered. I have them out of the lime pits, behind the walls, near the old quarry. And this cousin of the Fulgers will not come for them until late tonight. That is right. He has received permission to bring a hearse and two coffins. Otto Krantz smiled. Good. We shall be all right then. This cousin of the Fulgers will not examine the bodies too closely, I think. He will not even bother to search for bullet wounds. But they're headless. Exactly. A smile crept over Kranz's face. Even in the twilight, Fritz could see that smile. And he shuddered. What is it you will do? Do you remember the last words of Joachim Fulger? Kranz whispered. Yes. As ye so, so shall ye reap. That's from the Bible, isn't it? Exactly, Krantz grinned. The old fool meant it as a warning. Instead, it will be our salvation. But I don't see... Never mind. Go out at once to the shop down the street. Purchase five yards of strong catgut and a surgical needle. I will meet you at the lime pits tonight at eight. I'll bring the sack with me. Now do you understand? Fritz understood. He was still shuddering as Kranz pushed him out into the hall towards the stairs. It was a grisly ordeal. They worked in darkness, 
lest a light betray their presence to SS troopers on guard in the pits beyond. They crouched in the little shed, in utter blackness, and groped their way about the business in silence. Fortunately, there was no trouble in locating the bodies. Fritz had carefully set them aside for immediate internment. The rest was up to Krantz. He was no surgeon, but his fingers held a skill born of utter desperation. If he bungled the task, his life was forfeit, and he knew it. He strung the cat gut and sewed. The needle rose and fell, rose and fell, rose and fell in darkness as Otto Krantz pursued his fancy work. And then it was done. Done amidst the shuddering whimpers that rose from Fritz's frantic throat. But Krantz held his nerve to the last. It was he who added the final touch, binding the high collars about the two white throats and carefully padding the prison shirts into place beneath. His sense of touch served him well in this last gesture of precaution. At last he sighed, signifying that the task was complete. Fritz wanted to bolt for it then. Krantz whispered that he must wait, must hide by the wall across the way from the shed until they saw the cousin actually come and take the bodies away. Then, and only then, would he be certain of their safety. So they waited. Waited until midnight in the darkness. What phantasms it held for Fritz, Otto Krantz could not say. But as he stared into the night, he saw the grinning faces of Joachim and Eva Fulger hanging bodiless in midair, their eyes alive with undying mockery. Krantz pressed his eyelids together, but the faces remained, their leering mouths twisted as though in an effort to speak from beyond the barrier of death. What were they trying to tell him? Krantz didn't know. He didn't want to know. The hands which had wielded the surgical needle so expertly now hung limply at his sides as he waited. Then the hearse came. The cousin, escorted by a guard, went into the little shed. Two mortician's assistants brought the coffins. Krantz held his breath as they disappeared inside the shed. They were not inside long. Soon they reappeared, carrying the closed coffins. They did not speak. There was no sign of agitation. The coffins were placed inside and the car drove away. It was then that Krantz broke and ran, sobbing from the scene. He was safe. Everything was over and he was safe. The heads were back on their bodies. He got to his room somehow. Perhaps he might snatch a few hours of sleep before dawn. Then he must get up and return to duty as though nothing had happened. But now, to sleep. But Otto Kranz did not sleep. The heads were back on their bodies. Yet they would not go away. They were waiting for Krantz in his room. He saw them hanging in the shadows, even when he turned on the lights. They hung there, the head of the old man with the long white hair, and the head of the girl with her flaming curls. And they laughed at Krantz. They laughed at him. Krantz bared his teeth. Let them laugh. He was Otto Krantz, headsman of the Reich. Krantz, the executioner, whom all men feared. 
he had outsmarted them after all. Now they would be buried away in a grave, and no one would ever know that Krantz had murdered them. Krantz told them this in whispers, and they nodded to each other, sharing secrets. But Krantz did not mind. He was no longer afraid. He almost welcomed the coming of dawn in this changed mood. He donned his immaculate evening dress carefully. He brushed his stiff collar into place before the bureau. The heads laughed at him over his shoulder in the mirror. But he didn't care about that now. He swaggered through the street on his way to headquarters, cradling the axe in its case against his brawny chest. A passing guard drew stiffly to attention as Krantz marched by. Krantz laughed. There. Wasn't that proof of his importance? His cleverness? Let the heads understand that he was a man of position, of power. Otto Krantz knew he had nothing to fear. He would go about his duties today without question. He squared his shoulders and marched up the steps into the outer office. He wasn't worried. He knew no one else could see the heads but himself. He smiled at the man behind the desk. That was the way. Brazen it out. I'd like to see Inspector Grunert, please, about today's orders. Is he here yet? The inspector left word for you to go right in. The inspector was waiting for him. That's the kind of man Otto Krantz was. Inspectors waited for his arrival. He smiled derisively at the heads. Then he strutted into Inspector Grunert's office. The inspector was waiting. Krantz realized that just as soon as the two Gestapo men stepped from behind the door and pinned his arms close to his sides. They took the axe. They held him tightly. He could not struggle. He could only gape. He could only pant. He could only listen to what Grunert was saying. Otto Krantz, I arrest you in the name of the Third Reich for the murder of Joachim and Eva Fulger. Oh, but what was he talking about? The Fulgers were in their graves by now, buried. No, they weren't. The inspector was pulling the sheet from the table over in the corner, and Otto Krantz stared. He saw the heads again, and this time everyone could see them. They were grinning up at him now from over the tops of the sheets. Somehow, he dragged his captors forward with him. He bent over the bodies. He wanted to know how, or know why they had been discovered. They looked all right. The heads had been sewed on tightly, perfectly. The high collars were still in place. Nothing was wrong with his work. Nothing looked suspicious. Why? The collars hadn't even been pulled back to disclose any of the sewing. Then what was wrong? Krantz gazed at the still bodies, trying to read the secret. He didn't hear any of Inspector Grunert's mumblings about madmen, about murder. He was trying to remember what had happened. As ye sow, the old man had warned. As ye so. Then Otto Krantz's gaze traveled up again to the heads of the dead wizard and his daughter. He screamed. Once. Too bad you didn't have any light to work with in that shed, Inspector Gruner purred. Otto Krantz didn't hear him. He was staring madly at the grinning heads of the old man and the girl the heads he had sewed back on in the darkness and inadvertently switched. <laughs>